All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is January 6th, 2024. I got it right. We are in 2024. And brothers and sisters, tonight we're going to have some fun. I've been debating where I was going to go with today's teaching. I didn't know. I mean, there's so many hundreds of things that we can go into, but I didn't have any new revelation. I didn't have something, you know, we're digging into many, many different areas right now, as we always are. But I don't have that that piece, that that another piece for this video that was ready yet. Um, so I've been debating, you know, which direction am I going to go? Lord, you have something new for me. You know, what would you like to show me? And up till late this morning, I was still thinking, my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do for today's show. I mean, I know there are many different areas, Lord, and we can touch up and we can strengthen and remind because there's things we haven't shared in a long time. Well, then I saw an email that had come in. Uh, I was going through my emails and I saw an email from our brother Earl and I was going through the email and it hit me. I was like, that's the perfect topic. And why is it the perfect topic? Well, you guys will have already seen the title to this video. It's the perfect topic because everybody is starting to talk about it again. And it's all because of, of this Revelation 12 sign image that was on the U.S. debt clock uh, count. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to share it with you. I'm gonna, for those of you who haven't seen, I'm going to show you where it was and, and what this has done within the Watchmen community to get people kind of abuzz and talking again. Of course, it came, I believe, through Scotty Clark, who saw it there, uh, and it was at the time when the image that Scotty had done years ago, almost a little over six years ago now, had done that image, and that was the image there. Now, I guess from what I've heard, the image changes every day. So I thought this would be a great time since everybody is talking about it, and, and I pray over it as I always do, that the Spirit will lead those who are seeking. You see, when, when I realized that this was going to be the video today, it wasn't... It wasn't just about, oh, this is what everybody's doing, so let me jump on it. No, 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 because that's not, what gonna, what, that's not what's gonna happen. We're not gonna be talking about the same things that everybody else talks about. We're gonna reveal why I believe the Revelation 12 sign of 2017 was the beginning marker. And you'll understand why as we get into it, because I've shared on this years ago, and it's when my ministry first officially began, in June of 2017, everybody knows my story. It wasn't until uh, September 8th of 2017 when everything changed, when I knew I had started to understand something. And from that moment forward, my life has changed. Everything has changed. And I've done this now full time. It's now been about six years full time. And it's been revelation after revelation, hundreds and hundreds of mysteries revealed. But to get there, we had to first understand a few things, right? We had to understand the differences in the Gospels, that these differences in the Gospels are not just about, you know, what people say, well, they're contradictions. You know, maybe it's another perspective. No, it was all about prophecy. And we've revealed that and have shown that here in this ministry, which is how it all began. And to see that, you can come into the playlist here on YouTube and watch the Revealed End Time Study Note series, just watch the first four videos. Or from there, you can also choose to come to the Ministry Revealed uh, intro page. Just go to the menu, come to the intro page, and that'll take you to this page. And the first four videos are here, the same first four. But then there's a few different and a few the same on YouTube after that in that playlist, and there's different ones here as well. But the first four are the same. And this one is a 22-minute intro to the next three. It's only 22 minutes. It's all Bible studies. It's all with Scripture. And then this one, the first of the following three, is a 30-minute intro with the difference as who the Gospels are speaking to. Yes, it's absolutely 100% true. For anybody that's new that we prayed the Holy Spirit would come to, to open the eyes of those who are seeking, those who are thirsty, that they would come and seek these revelations. If that's you, you're in the right place. And this is where you begin with these first four videos. 
you can still watch today's video, but you're going to hear things about the differences in the Gospels. You're going to, I'm going to show you some, some uh, brief differences within the discourses as we go along to tie into this video. You're going to hear something like 21 and 22 years and, and that it's really a picture of like 14 years and, and then the 15th year is the Jubilee. And you're going to think, what is this guy talking about? You need, that's why you really need to start here. But you can still watch today's video and you'll understand it as we go along. But when you really, when you finish watching today's video and you really want to grasp it, then come over here and watch these four videos. Because this is where it all started on September 8th. That was the beginning on September 8th was this difference that I caught in Revelation chapter 12 to Luke's gospel. And it dawned on me. And I'm going to cover that briefly as we get going. The next thing you're going to realize is that the end of days is not seven years, but the seals, uh, seals tribulation and trumpets tribula tribulation is a total of 14 years. And there's a short period of time of 50 days that come first. That's Luke's portion. But it's Luke's in the sense that the bride goes at the beginning of those 50, whereas the great multitude mid-trib rapture, Mark's group, the world, the sleeping church that wasn't ready, they're going in the seventh year of seals, and then, of course, it's the Lord's return, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the 14th year of the end of tribulation, which is the seventh year of trumpets. It's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And you're going to say, wow, this guy has really lost his mind. But I promise you, in this 30-minute intro to it, after this 30-minute intro, you will begin to see it for yourselves. Don't take my word for it. This is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be a Berean and go and seek these things out. To see that they're true, right? See that they're true. See if they're not. Ask questions if you need to. You should all be doing it, right? And when you realize that it's the differences in the Gospels that reveal the seven years of seals and trumpets, and seven years of trumpets, you'll realize why it was all missed. And it's all because of Matthew. This is a, a big video. It's about two hours and 45 minutes long, and it is powerful. It will reveal why we've only understood seven years of tribulation and it's all because we've been taught from the foundation of the gospel of matthew so when you have matthew's eyes which is written to judah you'll realize that that's the reason you've only seen seven years that's why so many people think it's the great multitude everybody's raptured pre-trib it's because it's as if they're at the end of six years of seals and they're in revelation chapter seven waiting for the great multitude rapture where everybody goes. Well, that's simply not the case. And you'll understand it within all of these videos. You'll begin to understand it. So those are the intros. Then it goes deeper. This is a three-hour teaching that really goes into the differences within the Gospels, proving to you that they're all prophetic differences that reveal things for the end of days. You'll see the discourses, that it's Luke, Mark, Matthew. The last will be first, the first will be last. It goes Luke, Mark, Matthew in the end of days. And you'll see these differences in the discourses. It will blow your mind and they will all start to make sense. That's why the discourses speak differently. Similar in Mark and in Matthew, yet different. And Matthew's is much longer because everybody seems to forget that Matthew's discourse also goes into chapter 25. You'll see that pre, mid, and post are all true. You can see the pre and the triumphal transfiguration and resurrection story of Luke. You can see a mid-picture typology in all three in Mark. You can see a post-trib picture of all three in Matthew. It's that wild. It's truly that wild, and these videos will help you understand it. And then it goes really crazy. We've got the seven churches revealed in the end of days over this 14 years and the 50 days above. And then we're not going to get into this today, but we're going to touch on it as we go along in today's video. It's all a fractal you're going to see that the beginning of creation reveals the entire prophetic story of the end of days from the beginning of creation to the end of revelation. And you're going to see, so even though this is the ministry that reveals the 14 years, because it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, and there's the 50 days above it, it's really even a bigger picture than that. And we're going to talk on that. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to reveal it to you in scripture because we have typologies in all of these things that are given to us all of these things are shown to us in scripture if you have the eyes to see 
And that's what I want to share with you. That's what I want to pray over you, that you will have the eyes, the ears, and the heart to receive these things. Because I promise you, once you see them, you will never be able to unsee them, and you wouldn't want to. You will be so excited to be able to understand Scripture in a way that you have never been able to understand before. These things that have been confused, these things that have been twisted and sandwiched and, and pretzeled together to make fit, you will now see them clearly all in their places. It is that powerful. And where does it all begin? Well, brothers and sisters, it's going to begin with the Revelation 12 sign. That's where it begins. So before we get there, I wanted to share this with you. This came from the forum. So when I talk about the forum, uh, anybody who's interested, you can go to ministryrevealed.com. We were just there at the website. You can click on the menu box. You can come over here to the forum, click on there. It'll take you, I don't know, five, 10 seconds to sign up. It's free, about 1,200 people around the world, and we're sharing in there events, uh, uh, global events, news, prayers, Bible studies, all sorts of things going on in there. And you can join there. And you can come and see these things being posted and, and interact with like-minded brothers and sisters from around the world. Now, this that I'm going to share now is just something really awesome. It's just a great little share. It's a short video from uh, YouTube here. And I want you guys to hear it because I think it's just it's going to bless you. It blessed me. It blessed many in the, in the, in the forum uh, that saw it. And my wife as well. She loved it as well. So let me, let, let me share this with you. Let's have a listen. And then we'll get going come up on this old lake way back in the woods and I saw an eagle all the way across it. You see the lake. And I said, Lord, I sure would like to get close to that eagle because sometimes I feel like you don't always hear me. But if you hear me today, let me get close. <laughs> I had a bald eagle land on my shoulder out here hunting. I don't think you can get no closer than that right there <laughs> at all. God, I just. <laughs> How awesome was that, right? Lord, you know, because, you know, we pray and we ask the Lord and, you know, sometimes there's no response, right? And uh, or if not, most times there's not really any response that we're aware of, right? So every once in a while when things like that happen, you're just like, wow. And that guy just wanted to be close to the eagle prayed to the Lord, Lord, you know, if you're near, if you hear me, please let me get close to that eagle. And it lands on his shoulder. A wild eagle lands on the guy's shoulder in the wild. Craziness, right? That's just the Lord saying, I'm here. Don't worry. I'm always here, brother. Right? So awesome. So awesome. So with that start, let's get into this. Here's the Revelation 12 sign, of course, everybody knows. And this was essentially what was shared on the uh, U.S. debt clock. So this is what has everybody a buzz. So this usdebtclock.org, it's not a government-run um, uh, website. Um, it's an independently run thing. And I believe, uh, as you're going to see, so those of you who haven't seen it, look at that U.S. national debt, $34 trillion. Yeah, like that's going to get paid back. It's going to get wiped out. That's what's coming. Wiped out for everybody. But what you come to find out is that it's it's probably really a Christian organization or a Christian person or a small group of people that uh, have set this up. And it all had to do with this secret window. And I believe it was Scotty, Scotty Clark that found it. It was shared on uh, the, the link to that video was shared on the uh, forum as well. But when you click on it, you see old kingdom, debt, serfdom, new kingdom, wealthy freedom. So generally you find this type of thing in this secret window. I didn't know about it either. I don't really visit this thing at all. And so you know that it's a Christian organization uh, or a Christian small group of people or even an individual. And what had happened was the Revelation 12 sign was shown in there. And so um, I haven't listened to everybody talking about it, but I've heard some comments and, you know, some people are, are wondering, you know, was it posted on purpose? Was it was it a sign to pay attention again? Was it this? Was it that? All I can say is the reason I'm bringing this to everybody's attention now is because it started for, for us here in this ministry uh, probably around late spring last year when I realized, and I said it um, around, again, middish late spring last year, that 
I believe now Scotty Clark is going to be proven quote unquote right. And what I mean by that is I do believe that the Revelation 12 sign was the marker. It was the marker. You see, what had happened in in um, uh, 2017, so on September 8th, when this thing happened to me, and I knew that that something had changed. I had, I had known, excuse me one sec, I had known that it, this wasn't the Revelation 12 sign that was coming. And it began the entire process of all of these revelations. And what had happened is, is it started, and this is what I'm going to show you here. In, in, on September 8th, I was going through Revelation 12 like so many people were in September of 2017. And what they were saying, that this was the Revelation 12 sign. And then they were trying to find things to, to say the red dragon. And then they see uh, verse 5, and her child was caught up. And they're saying, see, this is the rapture. So there's the sign on, on September of 2017. The rest of these events shortly would happen. And then there's your rapture. And it was expected sometime soon after. Well, what had happened for me is it started by realizing what it said here. Because even though verse 1 is the Revelation 12 sign, it's, it wasn't the sign. And how we began to understand it was by the word appeared. It's so important. You see this program I use here? It's called eSword. eSword, I think, .net. And when you go in it, and there's many programs like this. I just love this one. I've used it since the beginning is you can get all the different Bible translations, and I use KJV+, Plus, and it gives you the strong concordance at your fingertips. And when you have something like this, a program like this, it might be free. It used to be free, maybe five, six, seven dollars a year. I don't know, something like that now. Um, but when you have a program like this, it will reveal the scriptures to you so much more when you dig into the definitions of the words. And so... Since 2017 in September, I've been late September, I was saying this isn't going to be the Revelation 12 sign. Now, I was still hopeful <laughs> as it got closer, but I started to say that it couldn't be. And it's because of the definition of appeared a great wonder in heaven. So here's the word for appeared. Now, if you don't have the Strong's Concordance and you're just simply reading the words of Scripture, there's no reason why you wouldn't think Revelation 12 was potentially it, right? Because you saw this alignment with the stars and the planets, excuse me, and the sun and the moon. You would think, sure, it makes sense. Except when you read the definition of the word appeared. And the word appeared is to gaze that is with eyes wide open at something remarkable. And thus differing from which denotes simply voluntary observation. Now, the Revelation 12 sign, which I believe is the, was the starting gate sign, which I'm gonna, we're going to get into tonight, is it, it couldn't have been the event, but it was the sign to get us watching. And tens of millions of people were watching for it. And when it passed, millions upon millions went back to sleep thinking, ah, just another thing, you know, just another false prophecy. You see? And we didn't know what to do with it, but we knew that it wasn't the sign. Sure, maybe it was a marker, maybe it was something, but we didn't even yet fully understand if it was a marker or not. Once it really clicked was last spring when I started mentioning it. And we're going to talk about why. Many of you guys already know. Most that have been in the ministry for a while, they know everything I'm going to cover tonight, but I'm going to cover huge portions of Scripture to bring the entirety of the whole big picture to the understanding of everybody and that everybody could be ready because I absolutely believe, I believe we have proven it scripturally that 2024 is going to be the year and I'm going to show you these connections to it and why. So, you see, what we did in 2017 was a voluntary observation. It wasn't something you had to stare at it with eyes wide open to be in amazement at something remarkable. That wasn't what it was. It was a voluntary observation, okay, which is the opposite of what the definition of the word is. 
And it says, and from the other uh, uh, Greek word, which expresses merely mechanical, passive, or casual vision. Well, not only was the Revelation 12 of, of 2017 voluntary observation, it was also mechanical, like literally mechanical, right? You couldn't have really found it or even known it was there without having had the um, Stellarium or a program like Stellarium. You couldn't look up at the sun because it would be the part of it would be before the sun came up and the rest of it would be after the sun went down. Nobody would have had a clue. But am I denying that it wasn't something? No. That's what today is going to be about. To, to hopefully get the attention of those who are who are now talking about it again, who are seeking about it, who who are who are trying to to grasp what the understanding of it is and why it was important, why it got the attention of tens of millions of people, but also to show you it wasn't the event because the event is still coming and it won't be something voluntarily observed or passively casually looked at it will be something that will have people with their jaws dropped with their mouths wide open saying oh my goodness okay does that sound familiar to anybody well it should it might sound very familiar it might even sound like luke's discourse and as you begin to understand that it goes luke mark matthew you might begin to understand why the coming of the Son of Man in Luke's discourse is spoken of very differently than Mark's and then Matthew's. You see, when you go to the intro series and you watch that 30-minute 30, 30 minute intro of the differences in the Gospels, one of the, the, the most fun, simple, straightforward, there's a few of them, but one of the, the best ones to point to is this right here. In Luke 21, 27, it said, and then... Shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud? First of all, the word is singular, and the word in literally means the word in. If you go to Mark's discourse, it says in the clouds, the clouds are plural, and it's the same word in 1722, but it says the word clouds. That's when he comes at the end of six years of seals, and the great multitude rapture happens in the midst of the seventh year of seals. When you go to Matthew, in Matthew's discourse, it says, then shall they see him coming in uh, the clouds. So it sounds like Mark's again. It says in uh, the clouds, plural. So it sounds like Mark's. The only difference is the word in isn't the word in. Let me show it to you. The word in, when it comes to Matthew's, isn't the same as Luke and Mark's. It's the word uh, coming in the clouds. You see that? It looks like Mark's. If you don't have a Strong's Concordance, you wouldn't know the difference. So where Mark and Luke, were, when he's in the cloud coming pre and in the clouds coming mid, it's the Greek word 1722. But in Matthew, it's the Greek word 1909. Isn't that confusing? Could you imagine reading this your whole life and you kept thinking it was in, in, in? So it was saying the same story, but you never noticed the S and you didn't realize that the word in wasn't actually in. It means on. On. Matthew's discourse and the coming of the Son of Man in Matthew's discourse is when he comes on the clouds, plural, when he's going to be seen from one end unto the other as lightning from one end unto the other. You see, this is is the importance of having a Strong's Concordance like this program at your fingertips and why, once you understand the differences in the Gospels, it is so mind-blowingly earth-shattering to your revelation of understanding going to clear up so, so many things for you. So now when we come back to Luke 21 and we see this, Listen to what it says. It says, so this is at the coming of the Son of Man for his pre-trib group. It says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear 
and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Hello. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Now, is everybody going to see him coming? Nope. Only the ones that are his pre-trib Gentile bride ready to be taken out. That's what's happening. You see, what does this sound like? You notice you don't get this in Mark and you don't get this in Matthew. It's a completely different conversation. This is the Revelation 12 conversation that's taking place. Okay? But what happens and how you can know this is look at what comes next. And this is where it started for me in September. This is what first caught my attention in September, 20, uh, uh, September 8th in 2017. It was right here. In Revelation 12, verse 2, it says, And she, being with child, cried, listen to this, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Now, why didn't this make sense to me? Something, what, what caught my attention? What was so important that it changed everything for me? And I knew outside of the word appeared, which is clearly something that's going to be seen, that's going to be so remarkable, so all watching from a distance, appearing that's going to be coming, connected to the sun, moon, and stars, like Luke said. Well, when you come to Isaiah 66, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. And I remembered pastors. So what had happened is I remembered pastors teaching on this years ago, like Perry Stone and others out there. And so when I read it again, on that day, on September 8, 2017, this is what came to my mind. And I thought, hold on a second. And then I started digging when I was done that video. And I was revealed that it was Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And there was these differences. And that's what all started to come to light. Because listen to what Isaiah 6, 66 verse 7 says. Before she travailed. Before she travailed. Well, Revelation just 12, verse 2, says then she was travailing, right? This says before she travailed, listen to this, she brought forth. See that? Before she travailed, she brought forth. That means before the travailing is the pre-trip. Watch this. Before her pain. So there's the travailing. So before the travailing and the pain, she brought forth, and that's the pre-trip before her pain which means the time of travailing but before the pain she was delivered of a man child so let's go back now to revelation chapter 12 and let's have a closer look at it and at the end of the video we're going to cover all of revelation 12 and you'll understand the timing as you never have before especially if you're new so we're going to see this wonder whatever this is going to be and it's going to be things coming to the earth, and it's going to be pretty, it's going to freak some people out, right? Well, verse 2 says, and she being with child, cried, travailing, and in pain. So there's the travailing, and there's the pain. What did it say? It said, before she travailed, she brought forth. Do you know why? Because this, before the travailing, which means after the sign and before the travailing, the pre-trib bride of Christ is gone. This is what dawned on me that day while everybody was saying the was caught up was the pre-trib. It couldn't have been. Because Isaiah said, before she travailed, she brought forth. So what's the travailing? The travailing is is part of that of the of the scriptures I was telling you that comes in the above 14 years. It's a period of time we've revealed to be the 50 days that come before the 14 years, the seven years of seals and the seven years of trumpets begin. Okay, this is what's happening. And so we see that the pre-trib bride happens before the travailing and the pained, and yet before the pained, but during the travail, she's also delivered of a man-child. And we were able to reveal here that that portion of Luke's discourse is the 40 days of travail. When the Son of Man is coming as Jonah the prophet, the Son of Man is going to be here 
for 40 days warning, just as he said he would do in Luke 11. We see him doing it here in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, uh, uh, sorry, in Luke 21, right here in verse 20, he says, And when you shall, shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is near. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the, uh, in the countries enter thereinto, because these are the days of vengeance that all things will now begin. This is the Son of Man who will be here as the white horse rider, warning what's about to begin and it doesn't begin until matthew's discourse at nation against nation kingdom against kingdom what what is this beginning you see mark's discourse has nation against nation kingdom against kingdom when it all begins there's no but first or this first it starts with nation against nation kingdom against kingdom this is the red horse rider the red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, begins the 14 years. But when does it begin? You see, it begins, according to Revelation 12, after the pre-trib is gone, which is before the travailing. Then you have the travailing, which represents the 40 days of the Son of Man here. But Isaiah 66, 7 said it was before the pain. So what does the word pained represent? The word pained represents pain, torture, torment. What do you think this means? This is a representation of the first two and a half years of seals tribulation. That's what it is. It's World War III that breaks out, beginning with the destruction of Jerusalem that he was warning against as he said he would do as Jonah did, and he will do it as the white horse rider. This happens in the above 14 years. This is why only Luke's discourse has this. When the others will tell you nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, Luke also tells you that. Then said he unto them, Luke 21, 10, then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes, famines, and so forth. And then listen to what he says in verse 12. But before all these. Only Luke's discourse tells you this. What's he saying? He's saying that all of this that I'm about to tell you next, all of this stuff that I'm telling you about next, is going to happen before Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, fearful sights, and everything else. You do not see this in Mark or in Matthew, this portion called before. This is what we're seeing here. This is what's happening in the Revelation chapter 12 sign. So now when we come back to the Revelation 12 sign, you can see from what I'm telling you, that if the Revelation 12 sign, quote unquote, from 2017, wasn't actually the sign, the event that's coming, well, why are you saying that it is connected? Why are you saying that it is some sort of sign? The answer is, there's a big picture. You see, it's not only about a revelation of 14 years and this portion of 50 days that comes first. There's an incredible mystery hidden in the creations of the earth that reveal the entire story. And also in the beginning of Genesis or in, uh, in the midst of Genesis in the story of Jacob. You see, this is the big picture. This is the big picture, the whole story. There are seven easy years or seven years that come first. And then right before those seven years come to an end at the Feast of Trumpets, there is a period of 50 days. These are the 50 days of the bride's escape, like the, the sign being shown, right? The actual event taking place. It will be the 
the 40 days of the Son of Man after the pre-trib escape? You see, this these are the events. So what you're reading in Luke's discourse is the final 50 days when the pre-trib happens and then the events that will take place <coughs> Excuse me, during the final 40 to 50 days within this before the 14 years begin at the Red Horse Rider at the destruction of Jerusalem at the Feast of Trumpets. This is what's coming. So what are we seeing? We're seeing what we call seven quote-unquote easy years. These are the seven years where the Spirit has been preparing and waking up the Gentile bride. When did it happen for most of you? 2017? See, what if we use this chart here? Look at where the 21 years begin. See that? Where did the years begin? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, seven. What most people haven't understood is that the years of tribulation coming to an end, you've got the seven easy years where the Spirit is preparing the Gentile bride. You've got the seven years of seals, the seven years of trumpets. These are the final sevens in a jubilee cycle count. Which means when the final seven year comes to an end, it must be the final jubilee. And on this chart that we have, we broke this down all the way from when Christ said it from Luke chapter 3 into Luke chapter 4 when he spoke about the jubilee by, by things, uh, um, by the, the words that were from Isaiah 61 or even from uh, uh, um, Leviticus 26. He was speaking the words of a jubilee that were at hand in Luke chapter 4. And we were able to discern and understand from Luke chapter 3 what year it was so we were able to understand that if we do a year count and start counting the cycles because he was proclaiming 29 AD to be the Jubilee, all we did was follow the seven-year Shemitahs all the way from 29 AD, all the way through. And it just so happened this equaled the Jubilee year. For that to equal the Jubilee year, look at where this started. In what we call the big picture, it started at the Feast of Trumpets 2017. You seeing why this is a, a big deal? Because that would mean that the Revelation 12 sign was the first year, was the, the big picture, what we call the 21 year to the 22nd year, which is the Jubilee, is called the big picture. This is where the Lord is excited, the Spirit is excited, waking up his Gentile bride, waking up the people, getting them spirit-filled in Christ. And when those seven years come to an end or that 50 days right before they come to an end, bam, Gentile bride is gone. And when those 50 days are over, the tribulation of the 14 years, seven of seals and seven of trumpets will begin at the Feast of Trumpets in that year, which this, from a count of 29 A.D., reveals is the Feast of Trumpets 2024. What would that make the Revelation 12 sign? Day one of the big picture, 21 years to the 22nd year, which is the final Jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign. You're thinking, what is he talking about? 21 years? Uh, this big picture in this count? What, what is all of this? Well, let me show you where you can start to understand it more. For those that don't know, the Hebrew alphabet is 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Do you know what it begins with? It begins with Aleph, and it ends with Tav. The Aleph and the Tav. The beginning and the end. 22 letters. Right? Why is it important? They all have pictographs and everything else too, right? What is the Aleph? It's the ox. It's Taurus. Okay? It's the Aleph. What's the Tav? It's the cross, right? Cross sticks, the mark, the sign. It's the cross. He's the beginning and the end, the Aleph and the Tav. And of course, look what happens when we go into Revelation chapter 22. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to take you now into the big picture. In Revelation chapter 22, it says, and he showed me a pure river of, of the water of life, 
clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Okay, when is this? This is after the millennial reign and the new heavens and the new earth have come down, or the new heaven and the new earth have come down. This is the beginning of eternity. Okay, and when the beginning of eternity starts, it starts with the cleansing with water, right, coming out from the throne of God in the big picture. What, what would this be in the big picture? Well, it would be the 22nd year, right? Seven, seven, seven is 21. And then at the start of the 22nd year, so at the beginning of it, bang. It's what? Well, not only is it the Jubilee and the new beginning of the millennial reign, you're also going to find out something that's going to blow your mind. This isn't just the, 20, the, 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 the new beginning after the millennial reign. This is actually the beginning of the 22nd thousandth year since creation. You got it. And what is Jesus what is Jesus called here? We all know this, right? Revelation 22:13. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Where is he saying it? In Revelation 22, at the end of the millennial reign and the, the beginning of eternity, he's saying he's the beginning and the end. Where is he saying this from? The end. He's saying it from the omega, end, and last. But what is he? He's alpha. What's alpha? What's alpha in Hebrew? Alpha in Hebrew is aleph. Aleph. He is the head, the Taurus, the ox. He is the Aleph. That's the beginning. Okay? So he's Taurus, the head of Taurus. He's the beginning. He's the first. Well, do you know what happens now if you go to the beginning of the Bible? You find the word, you guessed it, in the beginning. This is Christ. The word beginning is Christ. We've shared this a lot over the last year and a bit. This is Christ. He is what? The first and the beginning. What is this in Hebrew? Aleph. <laughs> so in Revelation 22, at the end of the millennial reign, he is the end. He is the omega. He is the last. And in the beginning, he is the beginning. He is Aleph. He is first. It's Christ. Did you realize how many chapters? are in the book of Revelation, seven, 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 and one. 22 chapters. Isn't that interesting? 22 chapters. How many letters in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. Coincidence? You're about to see no chance on God's green earth that it's coincidence when he is called the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. No chance. It's just by chance. All right? And here's what you're going to begin to see. As, as, you're, as you're starting to grasp an understanding of seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, what you haven't been able to see is, well, what about this above portion? Right? I was just able to explain briefly that you've got the seven easy where the bride is being prepared and spirit filled and everything else. For those that are diligently seeking the Lord, that they're thirsty and, and seeking after him. And then that Luke's discourse is that 50, 40 day period after the pre trib escape. This is why in Luke's gospel, in his discourse, let's go down here. Everybody knows this one. It's a fantastic piece of scripture that everybody should know and pray over. In Luke 21, 36, well, I'll even start in 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy 
to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This comes before all of this. You see that? Luke's is the only one where the, the commentary at the end there is the pre-trib commentary, is what comes before all of these things. And it's clear to understand because what does he say? To be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. All what things? All these things that I've listed out here for you. To be accounted worthy to escape them all, including these things coming. You see, when men's hearts are failing them for fear of looking after these things that are coming, that's the moment of the pre-trib escape. That's why I say in Revelation 12, verse 1, that will be seen. But before verse 2 really gets started, the bride is gone. And when this really starts to break out on the earth, now they're starting that period of the chaos that follows after the pre-trib's gone. That's why Luke 21, 30, 36 and Luke's discourse is so vastly different than Mark and then Matthew's because the pre-trib bride will not experience it. They won't experience it. But what you're still not able to see is how can we prove out this? How can we prove out these first seven years? You know, we can prove out that the, the 50 days We've done it in many scriptures, and you could see it from Luke's discourse. You know that within this period of time, it's connected to the white horse rider. Once you understand that that is the Son of Man, he one of the seals was opened. They weren't all opened at once. It was one seal that was opened, which was the white one, and the white horse rider went out. It was the Son of Man who we've shown is going to be here for 40 days first before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom breaks out. So when I show you some of these things, you're going to be able to start to easily see the seven and the seven, the seven of Mark for seals, the seven of Matthew for trumpets. But this is what I'm going to be leading you into understanding so that you can understand why the Revelation 12 sign in 2017 was the beginning of the big picture count and why it's so important. Why when a, a count from 29 AD of when Jesus was declaring the Jubilee, why it was so important that it equaled here. Why it's so important that Jerusalem's 70 years end here and then destruction on all their enemies come in the final 14th year. He comes feet down on the Mount of Olives and destroys all of them in the great winepress of the wrath of Almighty God, which is the day of his vengeance and the year of his wrath. Okay? The day of his vengeance and the year of his wrath. So what, what are the 13 years that come before the 14th? Right? And, and how can we prove that these other seven are connected? And why is the Revelation 12 sign so important? Well, first of all, when you understand that the 70 ends here, and then there's one more year. When you understand that the count from 29 AD gives you a jubilee count, of 2038, 2039, which exactly is in line with the Revelation 12 sign, the, the pre-warning sign from 2017, starts to get you excited to realize that this is highly, probably, most likely, vastly possible, hugely important 2024. You're going to see this. So let's go into <laughs> Genesis chapter 21, uh, Genesis 1. And it's like I told you guys, we're going to be touching on this stuff about a fractal. So if you want to really dig further into it and you haven't seen it, you can come and watch this video after. It is truly going to have your jaw on the floor and you're just thinking, oh my goodness. Because what you're going to see is in the mystery of the creations is the revelation of 21,000 and the 22nd thousandth year, the beginning of eternity. Yep, you heard it right. Not only can I show it to you through what you're about to see, but as we go deeper, you're going to see it revealed through a picture, a prophetic picture within people in Scripture. So here's this key thing right here. In the beginning, 
So once you know that the beginning is Jesus, God the Son, and look at what it says. So it means in Jesus, again, for anybody that's new, if you're saying, well, what do you mean? Just because he's the beginning and the end, why does that word beginning mean Jesus? Well, right here. This word, Hebrew word 7225, is the word the first, the beginning. It's the word for the feast of first fruits. The feast of first fruits was Christ on resurrection day. It's the one without leaven. It could only be Christ. And he is the beginning and the end. So this really says, in Christ, God created the heaven and the earth. Which means, in Jesus, God the Father created. That's exactly what Paul tells us in Romans. It's all throughout Scripture. Jesus created everything in heaven and in earth. And it was the Father who gave it to him to go and create. So what do you think Jesus felt like? So you've got the Son, you've got the Father, and in verse 2 it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So you've got the Son, you've got the Father, and you've got the Holy Ghost. All three of them right there in verse 1 and 2 of Genesis. Now what do you think? How do you think Jesus felt when he began to create everything do you think he was excited do you think he was filled with joy with love and just absolute excitement i guarantee you he was he was probably so filled with joy that the father had said here it is son here are the plans go create it all he would have been so fired up, excited. I could only imagine. I could only imagine. And then look at what we see. Then we see the creation of days. This, Genesis 1, verse 1. Some people say just Genesis verse 1, uh, Genesis 1, verse 1. Others say Genesis verse 1 and 2. And I'm of the belief of it's Genesis verse 1 and 2. And then what you see in verse 3 is the beginning of the first day. And that's what we see. You see, verse 1 and verse 2 are called the gap theory. And in this gap theory, there's all sorts of things that is believed is what merges science and, let's see, is what merged science and, uh, um, uh, in scripture together so that there's no contradictions within what they believe so it says for some the gap theory allows both the genesis creation account and geological science uh to be inerrant in matters of scientific quote unquote i'll say fact gap creationists believe that certain facts about the past and the age of the earth have been omitted from the genesis account they hold that there was a gap of time in the biblical account that lasted an unknown number of years between the first creation in Genesis 1-1, and I would say 1-2, and the second creation from, I would say, verse 3 to Genesis 31, uh, 131. So they would say <laughs> that there was a creation that happened in verse 1 or verse 1 and verse 2 is one creation called the gap theory creation. And... A lot of them in this creation belief will say, well, this can account for how old science says the earth is. This can account for how old science says the dinosaurs are. Well, yes and absolutely not. And the reason I say that is because the Bible reveals to us how long this gap theory portion of Genesis verse 1 and verse 2 are. And it is not giving you millions and millions or billions of years it's only another 7000 in in our dimension of time it's only another 7000 years but to the lord god they would be days you're thinking oh my goodness now this guy has fully lost his mind well let me prove it to you because remember i'm leading this all to why the revelation 12 sign is so important Okay, 
Because all we get here in this creation is what? Two verses. This gap theory creation that science with scripture they believe can account for millions or billions of untold years that are there. I'm saying in the, the video, it's all a fractal, reveals that it was only another picture of seven days to the Lord God, which if we were in the dimension of time, it would have seemed like 7,000 years. But why do we only get this little gap of two verses? And how on earth can two verses reveal that it's really a picture of seven days or another 7,000 years in the dimension of time, if, if we were in the dimension of time there? Well, remember this. I think it's safe to say Jesus would have been ecstatic to go and begin creating. Right? So let's just set these two verses aside for a moment. And now I'm going to show you what comes next. We now see that God said, let there be light. And there was light. Who was this light? Well, according to John chapter one, Jesus was the light. Jesus is the light that divided the darkness from the light. You see, this is Jesus. This is what John was talking about in chapter one. He was the beginning. He was the word and the word was with God and the word was God because Jesus, the son is God as well. And there's God, the father. Then he was made light. So when he's made light, we have now the division of light and darkness, and we have the first day. Then we've got the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And in Genesis chapter two, we have the seventh day where the Lord, where the Lord God rested, where the Lord rested. Now, those are days. And everybody will tell you, yeah, no, no, it was just a 24-hour day. That's all it was. It was one day. And then what do we have? So we have this, we have this mystery, two verses. The Lord is excited to create gap theory creation of this first creation. Then we have seven days of creation. Six and the seventh he rested. Then. Not the same as then we get Adam being formed from the dust of the ground. From the time of Adam, we have begun 7,000 years. You following? Those seven days are something else. We've set those aside. So we've got the gap theory. A mysterious portion of time, only two verses, which we're going to get into. Then we've got seven days of creation, six, and the seventh was rest. Then we get to Genesis 2, and we begin 7,000 years from Adam, of which we're getting close to the end of 6,000, because the millennial reign is the 7,000th year. Okay, everybody's following that? I think most people know that from Adam, we are in a in the 7,000 year count and that the 7,000th, at the end of six, the 7,000th is the millennial reign. And when it's all over, what is it gonna be? It's gonna be the new beginning. It'll be eternity, right? The new heaven, the new earth. So if the first portion after the gap theory is seven days and then from adam we're living in the dimension of time so there's seven thousand well let's go see for those that haven't seen this before in second peter chapter three verse eight is where you get the revelation that pulls it all together it says but beloved be not ignorant that's pretty powerful wording right Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. This is how important it is. Don't be ignorant of this one thing, he tells us. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. What did we have? 
day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and day seven. There were seven days of that creation from Genesis chapter one, verse three to Genesis two, verse one. Each one of them was a day to the Lord. But what would they be like to us? They would be like a thousand years each. Which means each one of those days, because we weren't there in the dimension of time, each one of those seven days was to the Lord like a day. But if we were there in the dimension of time, each one of those days would have seemed like a thousand years each. Which means those seven days of creation are also a type picture of 7,000 years. You following? I'm not telling you this. It's telling you this right here in 2 Peter 3, 8. Now listen to what it says. Comma and, which means a separation and in addition to. What did we just see in Genesis chapter 2? That when Adam was created, it began the 7,000 years that we're now in. It'll be 6,000, and then the 7,000th year is the millennial reign. Well, look at what it says here. It reverses the order. A thousand years as one day. Hello. Beginning in Genesis, the days of creation, there were seven. If we were there in the dimension of time, they would have felt like a thousand each, which means those seven days to the Lord would have been like 7,000 to us. And then from Adam, we're living in the thousands of years from the formation and creation of Adam. But to the Lord, what are they? Each of them is still only as a day. Which means to the Lord, the seven days of creation were, were seven days. And from Adam, that seven, the years that we're in now in the thousands to the millennial reign, to the Lord, they're also, they're also only seven days. Which means to the Lord, they were seven days and that we're coming close to the end of seven more days. Well, we've got the tribulation and then the thousand years, which all to the Lord is another seven days. Seven days and seven days to the Lord. But for us, we are in 7,000 years. And those days to us, if we were there in the flesh in the time dimension, we would have been 7,000 years in those creation. So what does that make it? 7,000 years and 7,000 years. What does it make it to the Father? Seven days and seven days. Why do you think it says it days as thousands, comma, and, which means separate in addition to, thousands as days? Because the first ones were days that would have been like thousands if we were there in time, and the second portion was thousands that were in now, but to the Lord, they're still as days. Hello? You following what I'm saying? You hearing what I'm putting down? What is that telling us? That's telling us we still have to figure this out right here in this portion. But what have we just seen? We just saw that the creation of days were seven days to the Lord and would have been 7,000 if we were in the dimension of time, which was when Jesus was made light. Which means those creation, the creation of males and females in that dimension at that time were light beings. And when Jesus came, he said in Matthew 15 that he came not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The house of Israel is represented as Mark's gospel. It is the world with the Gentiles grafted in. It's, it's the house of Israel. Gentiles grafted in. It's represented by the world. And when Jesus came, what was he coming to do? Shine his light. 
to shed his light and to shine his light everywhere. And when he comes in those 40 days, he's coming to shine his light and to give power in his light to his remnant workers who will go and spread the light during the time of seals. But you see, it was the light portion. We saw it by day one when he was made light. In verse 3 of Genesis 1. So if, if the first days of creation were to the Lord days, but would have been if we were there in the dimension of time as thousands of years, it's seven days to the Lord, would have been 7,000 years to us. And what is the prophetic revelation of the end of days? Seven years. Then what happened? Well, then you have from uh, um, Adam, you have now the flesh was created. The flesh was created, and that's when the time of, of the Jews, if you will, the portion of the flesh, and then the Lord choosing a people from among the flesh, a group that he had always led and protected through, through lineages all the way through. Because, you see, in the flesh, there are those in the spirit, everyone's in the light, and we're all living in the age of the flesh, which is from Adam, which is what? The 7,000 years of which we're getting close, you know, about 14 and a half or so years away from the beginning of the, from the Jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign, which will be the 7,000th year from Adam. And to the Lord, what are they? They will have been like days, each of those 7,000. What are they representing in the end of days? Seven years. Seven days to the Lord. Seven days to the Lord. 7,000 if we were there in time to 7,000 that we're in right now. To the end of days, one for the group of light represented as seven years. One to the group of flesh represented as seven years. Seven years of seals. Seven years of trumpets, brothers and sisters. There it is right there revealed before your eyes from Scripture. But now what about this? How does this? I don't know why it's highlighting everything. There we go. How does this come into the picture? How does this first seven get proven out? To be able to take it back to the Revelation 12 sign. Well, we saw from the beginning. You see? In the beginning is what's represented here, right? We're going back now to Genesis chapter 1. Now that we've been able to see the seven years and seven years or seven days and seven days or, or 7,000 and 7,000, how do we see and prove this out to also be a 7,000 that came first but just flew by quickly because the Lord was so excited? Well, you see, we also have the Spirit of God here. And it is those who are Spirit-filled in Christ, who are what? Who have the Spirit of God, as Romans 8 says, who are the sons of God and co-heirs with Christ. You see, Genesis 1-1 is the beginning. Revelation 22 is the end. He is the beginning, and he is the end. And so what is the beginning? Right here, at the very beginning. Here's the beginning, and what's the end? You see, how many chapters of, of Revelation? 22. He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the Aleph and he's the Tav. You have seven, 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 and 22, the new beginning. You see, this is what we focus mainly here throughout this ministry is revealing the scriptures and how they prove out that the end of days is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, and then the 15th year is the final jubilee or the new beginning the, the, uh, with the millennial reign. But in the big picture, it's the 22nd thousandth year. But why don't we talk about it much? Well, because it's kind of, you know, unknowingly sort of like life as usual. There's no tribulation yet. The bride has no part in the tribulation. The pre-trib doesn't take part in the tribulation. 
They're the spirit-filled ones. They're the spirit-filled. Genesis verse chapter uh, Genesis 1, verse 2. It was the spirit of God over the waters. And what does water represent often oftentimes? People. Group of people. It's it's a picture. It's a typology picture in verse 2 of Genesis of the spirit-filled group when the spirit is over the waters. They're the picture of his pre-trib bride. But how does it explain that I could say that that gap theory is a prophetic, there, there's a picture in it that is really like another picture of his seven days because everything to him is as days, and all of it to us, if we were there in time, would have been as thousands, you see? But in the end of days, it was really seven years, and the Spirit waking up the bride that would have began on the Feast of Trumpets, 2017. This is why last spring, when I said, that it was so important that now we were able to understand it is because what Scotty Clark had done, even with all the abuse that he had taken after and everything he's gone through since. I don't know which track he's on. I don't know how his beliefs are. That isn't my point. My point is he did his job. He did what he was supposed to do. I believe it was absolutely spirit-led. And this year, in 2024, we're going to find out how spirit-led it really was. Because this right here would equal the pre-trib and the beginning of the 50 days that takes us to the end of 50 right here. And then the beginning of the 14 years of Mark's discourse, Red Horse Rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, either on the first or second of history, the day and hour no one knows, this will be the beginning of the 14 years when the 50 days are over. When the pre-trib bride is gone, the seven-day wedding in heaven has taken place. When, when the Son of Man is, has come and warned, as he did in Luke in his discourse, when he is the white horse rider for 40 days, and then when he leaves and an anointing of the Holy Ghost comes and what we call Acts 2.0 takes place on the 29th of Elul. This is going to be the beginning of the tribulation if, in fact, what we've proven out with Scripture, what we've proven out in year counts from biblical counts of Luke 3 into Luke 4, then it would seem that the Revelation chapter 12 sign and the beat down and everything that he took for nothing happening wasn't for nothing. It was to reveal to us the beginning marker count, not in a seven-year tribulation beginning, but in a big picture, 21 to the 22nd year picture which is why their alphabet, the beginning and the end, the Aleph and the Tav, is 22 letters long. The whole story, as we've just shown, this and this, the seven years of seals and the seven years of trumpets, are the days of creation and the years of thousands from Adam we have a mystery here that we've proven before, but I'm going to show you now that will reveal Feast of Trumpets 2017 was the beginning of the count. So let's go to that next. Watch this. Let's go to Genesis chapter 29. In Genesis chapter 29, you see, hopefully... I'm clear enough, I'm, I'm showing with enough precision, I'm going slow enough that anybody who's new, that the Spirit has led, who is thirsty, who's been seeking these things, is starting to see it. You still might think it's a little crazy, 
But I promise you, every single part and piece is from Scripture. And when you go to that intro series after this, it will all start to make more sense. Watch this. Let's start in Genesis 29, verse 16. And Laban had two daughters. So remember the story of Jacob. He goes, he goes to the well. He ends up seeing Rachel and he's like, whoa, dog, there's a, there's a looker. And he's all excited for Rachel. And it turns out that Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder, the name of the older firstborn is Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. Look at what Rachel uh, Leah means. Leah is tender-eyed. So she's weak, right? She's she's tender, she's weak, she's faint. This isn't uh, this is I mean she was the strongest one. She was the the best wife really, right? And what ended up happening is what it, what are the meanings of this? Look, an eye of a fountain, a well. We we've, we've done videos on this and her name means what? Weary. Weary. Do you know who's weary and who's tired, brothers and sisters? Do you know watchmen? Do you know people watching and praying diligently, seeking the Lord, who are tired, who are weary? Of course you do, right? Leah is the elder sister. Rachel, the beautiful one, is the younger one. And he favored Rachel, the beautiful younger one. Well, of course he did. But listen to what comes next. In Genesis 29, 18. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years. Pay close attention if you're new. I will serve you seven years for thy younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, or so he thought. Now listen to what's said next. They seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. How long did he serve? Seven years. Did he get anything at the beginning of those seven years? Nope. It wasn't until he served seven years that he got a bride and in it he was so excited to work those first seven years because he was so in love together that they only felt like a few days ring a bell he worked seven years he was so excited he was working seven years for but they only felt like a few days. Seven years. Think seven days to the Lord. Think 7,000 years if we were there. But he was so in love. He was so, what's another way of saying it? The Lord was so excited to create in the beginning that this part, in his creation, in the spirit of everything else he was creating there, he was so excited, they felt like days. How long was it? It was really 7,000 years. It was really seven days to the Lord. And in the end of days, it is the big picture seven years that came first and right before those seven years end there's going to be 50 days that come first so even though rachel's was a full seven years okay and then he finds out it's leah in the prophetic end of days there is a way of saying it was seven years you could say from Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks. Because if you realize that the Lord God, the Father, counts from Feast of Weeks to Feast of Weeks, 
it would make sense. And you could say Feast of Weeks 2017 to Feast of Weeks 2024 is your seven years. But the picture is the picture of the entire story of Jacob for his wives and working for his father-in-law. Is revealed in the entire creation and in the big picture of everything. And so even though it's seven years, but before the seven years are done, we've got 50 days. That's simply because of what must take place at the end of days. So what happens now when Jacob completes those first seven years? He fulfills those seven. They felt like days because they're like the gap creation. He was so excited. He was so in love in his creation to, to create it all. He was so in love. And when it was done, <laughs> he goes to his father-in-law and he says, give me my bride. Who does he get? Well, let's see what happens. Genesis 29, 22. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass that evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. <laughs> and it came to pass, verse 25, and it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore hast thou beguiled me? Now listen to his answer. And Laban said, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the older or before the firstborn before the eldest. You're about to understand why this is so powerfully important. So what does he say? <laughs> Fulfill her week. What week? Her wedding week. He's got to fulfill her wedding week. What are you going to have? Seven. And then the first seven days of the 50 is the wedding week of the Leah-type bride. The Gentile, weary-eyed, weakening, tired Gentile bride is the one he's getting first. It's his Leia. Fulfill her week, and I will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve me yet seven other years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. What was this week? It was the wedding week. It was this wedding feast, this marriage wedding feast that was taking place for seven days. And then he got Rachel, for which he still had to serve, what? Seven more years. Seven more years. Now, does that seem like the end of the story? You might think, oh, it should be seven years here and then seven more years here for a total of 14 years. That's really where your 14 years is, Alan. No, it's not. It's right here. It's a prophetic typology in the gap theory that reveals to us that in the beginning creation of verse one and two is a prophetic picture of the seven easy years that came first, I believe, that correspond to the Feast of Trumpets beginning at the Revelation 12 sign. At the Revelation 12 sign. And when those seven years are done, it will begin the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets 2024. We have a marker that begins it that tens of millions of people around the world were made aware of. People were talking about it everywhere. There was uh, document uh, um, documentaries and stuff done on it. And we have a prophetic count that brings us to 2038 as the beginning of the Jubilee year, all the way from the time of Christ in a Jubilee count, in a, in a Shemitah Sabbath year count that brings us all the way to the Jubilee year at the time of the Feast of Trumpets, or uh, uh, which goes to atonement in 2038. Okay, let's, let's see what else this says about it. What else do we know about this story with Rachel, Leah, and Jacob? Let's go to chapter 31. Let me prove to you that those 14 years aren't the seals and trumpets. In verse 41, 
Listen to this. Genesis 31, 41. Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I serve thee 14 years, okay, for your two daughters. That is the seven years that flew by like days when he expected Rachel, but he gets Leah. Then he works seven more years and he gets Rachel. But what did it say, the total number of years he served? It said 20. It said 20. So what did it say? Uh, for your two daughters and six years for your cattle, which is just a picture of showing for Judah another six years. What did he do at the end of those 20 years? What did he do which corresponds to this final year as the start of the 21st year? Well, look at what he says. Verse 44. Now, therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. So when 20 years are completed, the 20 years come to an end. What happens? They make a covenant at the beginning of the 21st year. You following? You're starting to see this now in a prophetic big picture of 21 to the 22nd year of the creation of seven and then seven days and then 7,000 being a picture of 7,000 and seven days. Seven days of the Lord, seven days of the Lord would have been like 7,000 to us and is 7,000 to us. What does that make this mystery? The mystery of seven days to the Lord or what would have been 7,000 to us in time but they flew by as days because he was so in love. Then he works seven more years for Rachel, and then he does seven, sorry, six more years for cattle, bringing us to the end of 20, which is a prophetic picture of bringing us to the end of the 13th year. What happens at the end of the 13th year? Well, it's a prophetic picture of the end of 20. He makes a covenant for the final year. Well, in the big picture, looking at these as thousands, or even seven, seven, seven to the Lord, or 7,000, 7,000, 7,000, what is this final picture? What is this final one right here? In the picture of thousands, it's the millennial reign. In the picture of the end of days, it's the final year of, of, of the 14 years of tribulation. And then what starts? The millennial reign. You see how wild this is? It's all there. The whole story's there. I'm going to show you why it's so important that you understand seven years, easy years, seven years of seals. Then six more years of trumpets is the picture of the first seven easy, seven years of seals, and six years of trumpets. And why it's important that he made a covenant at the end of those 20, at the end of those 20, which is the picture of a covenant being made at the end of the 13th, which means to start the 14th year of tribulation, which is the same as him starting the 21st year when him and his father-in-law make a covenant. All of it following in order. What's the big deal? Why, why was it seven more years for Rachel and then only six? Why wouldn't it have been just a total of 14 more? Why, why not just make it a picture of 777 seven, seven, nice and clearly? Well, because it's a prophetic picture, don't forget. And in the end of days, it's not simply 14 years, period. It's how it's broken down. And what you need to understand is that when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion in the clouds as we read in Mark. So not everybody's going to know what this is. The, the church and the people that, that have, have repented and come to Christ after the greatest revival in human history in the midst of chaos 
there's going to be hundreds of millions of people still alive going in the great multitude rapture. But they're not going as soon as they see them. They have no idea the time that they're going yet. When they see them coming, it will be the day and hour no one knows. But when they go, won't be until the midst of that seventh year of seals. The midst of it. Just like Revelation chapter 7. Why is this? Well, remember, if this is if this is Rachel and this is Leah, uh, sorry, if this is Leah and this is Rachel, this was the older and this was the younger. Why is it so important? Why was it so important that this custom was that the older goes first and then he sneaks and gives the older first? before the younger. Why was this such an important custom? Why was it discussed then? I'll tell you why. Because these are wheat. They are wheat, brothers and sisters. Leah is considered, is the prophetic, is a picture of what is called winter wheat. Rachel is what's considered a prophetic picture of spring wheat winter wheat is called old wheat and spring wheat is called new wheat winter wheat or old wheat is planted late fall takes root during winter and grows throughout spring and begins its harvest in summer, and it is done by late summer. When it is done, it can be used right away. This is Leviticus chapter 23, Deuteronomy 16, but Leviticus chapter 23, the two wave loaves of bread that have leaven. You see, we can't be barley. We can't be the first fruits of barley. That's Christ. This is the first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest, as, as uh, Exodus 34, 22 says. The first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest. It is winter wheat. There is no hold on winter wheat. It is called old wheat, and it's called winter wheat, not because it's old and decrepit. It's from when it's planted. Spring wheat, which is called younger wheat like Rachel, spring wheat is planted in the spring and isn't harvested until the fall. If the tribulation begins at the Feast of Trumpets in the fall time frame. And six years later would be the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. This would be the time when the spring wheat is now ready to be harvested. But... The great multitude rapture of the spring wheat doesn't happen until the second half of Revelation 7, which is in the midst of the seventh year of seals. It was ready at the end of six, but according to Jewish ways, the spring wheat isn't Kadosh or Yoshon, whatever it is. It's not ready for use until the second day of unleavened bread the following year. So about six months or so later, which is the midst of the seventh year of seals. You see, winter wheat is old wheat, which is why Leah is called the elder and was given first. She is a picture 
of the Gentile bride, the representation of the Luke group, who are the spirit-filled, who were part of the gap theory creation, which was like 7,000 years or seven days to the Lord, but was so excited that they felt like days. It was his spirit group creation. It's his Leia. The older before the creation of those in light. The spirit before the light. Rachel is the spring wheat, which is the new for which he had to serve seven more years. You see, does that mean in the prophetic typology, it's seven years, but it doesn't mean he's completing seven years, just like over here. It's not a full seven years. It's 50 days short, just like he does seven years for Rachel next. He completes seven years and then she's officially his. But is it actually going to be seven years? No, he's going to get her in the midst of the seventh year is the time of the great multitude rapture. You see how wild this is? And then what happens? Well, then you have six more years for the cattle. It's like a picture of Judah. Judah is a prophetic representation of the cattle. And you're going to see what happens at the end of 13 years. It's really, really eye-opening. It's really, really shocking to be able to track and follow and understand these things. Because you've probably heard this before in other teachings by pastors, by those putting on uh, plays or whatever it is, that in ancient times, women would be married at about 13 years of age. They would have a, right? They The, the marriage, so from birth, they might be given over, you know, maybe me and my best friend, I have a son, he has a daughter. We say, man, we're best friends. We should get our kids married. And we sign agreements. We have identical agreements chiseled out on a stone or hammered out on leather or whatever it is in wood. And we keep them to when she becomes of age. How old does she has, have to be before she's of age to get married? Well, let's have a look. Here's some uh, here's an example of some things. So call to marriage and engagement. Marriage took place at a young age for the ancient Jews. Most rabbis uh, proposed 18 was the most appropriate age to be married, but it wasn't uncommon for them to be younger, especially in times of peace. Young women were married almost as soon as they were physically ready, approximately 13 years of age. What about Mary, well, from the age of Jewish maidens became mar uh, marriageable, it is possible that Mary gave birth to her son when she was about 13 or 14 years of age. You see, because back then they would marry at about 13 years old. They came into an agreement. So the parents, if it happened when they were really young because they knew each other, then that agreement would be binding between the two families until she became 13 years of age. When they became 13 years of age, there was a marriage. Remember, these marriages were arranged. It wasn't because of beauty. It was because of, of standing within the family and to survive and so forth, right? So what ended up happening? Well, in that year, when she was 13, the parents, the families would get together and there would be what's called this right here. When a future bride has been chosen for a young man, either by his parents or rarely by himself, there followed a period of one year called betrothal. Okay? But this betrothal would have been based, like if we go back all the way to when they were just little kids, and it was me and my best friend, when she was 13, these agreements got uh, um, came into effect. And they would have a wedding. And in this wedding, it was just a simple legal wedding that was a binding wedding. And it would happen when she was 13 years of age. And then there was a one year period called a betrothal. So from 13 to 14, there was a betrothal 
an agreement. During this time, the couple still lived apart, okay? While delicate, often uh, protracted negotiations occurred between families regarding dowries. Uh, the groom and his family paid the dowry to the father of the bride, compensation for laws of working, and so forth. And then it talks about the marriage ceremonies. So what do you see here? 13 years of age, one year of a betrothal. What do we see here? 13 years, which is the prophetic big story picture of 20 coming to an end. And what happened? Then there was a one-year agreement. Then there was this betrothal year. This is what we read in Scripture when um, he went and prepared a place. See, he would go to prepare a place, and you read or you've seen pastors talk about it, that it would be 13 years old, then they would get married, and then he would go prepare a place in his father's house, and he would come back at the end of that one year at the father's sounding of the trumpet on the day and hour no one knows Hello. On the day and hour, no one knows he would come at the end of that year. So they knew it was about a year, right? But it's connected to the day and hour no one knows. Well, you realize that if it started at the Feast of Trumpets and that the 14 years nation against nation starts with the attack on Jerusalem that they were warned to flee from when they see the compassing about starts the attack on the Feast of Trumpets that the end of six years would be the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets, which means at the end of 13 would be the Feast of Trumpets, and the end of the 14th year would be him coming on the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets. Do you realize that there are two wedding stories in the Synoptic Gospels? There's one in Luke's Discourse, which is a picture of the pre-trib bride and a remnant worker group after that have a banquet meal. Do you know that the one in Matthew is the one that's talking about this post-trib one? I'm going to show this to you now in the discourses, and it's going to blow your minds. It's absolutely incredible to see and to understand. Because when you understand that even the entire story is 13 years and then one more year, and then the Jubilee, everything will make sense. Because it's a picture of the 13 years, then a, a, the main wedding to, to solidify everything, the one year of preparing the place, and then his return, and the new beginning for the two of them together. Watch this. Let's now go into Luke chapter 21. Now that you can see and understand this portion of Luke's discourse being connected to that gap theory, verse 1 and 2 of Genesis 1, you now understand this, this period of the Son of Man coming, the pre-trib bride already being gone. You can see this is where he's warning as the Son of Man while he's here for 40 days, as he said he would like Jonah. You can see this is the Revelation 12 sign. That's going to be the actual event that's going to be seen. You could see the pre-trib taking away, which is exactly what we're reading about here. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You see, it's the Gentile bride going first. Jesus isn't a Gentile. So she, he, it's like that one he didn't really want, right? It doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It doesn't mean he doesn't want us. It's prophetic typologies, right? It's those who are spirit-filled that were part of that spirit creation. They are the ones of Luke 21 going before all these things come to pass. But that we would see the Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, actual event taking place. This here is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. And this persecution that begins here isn't for the bride. 
The bride is already gone. The seven-day wedding has taken place like Leah's. Now the Son of Man has come to begin his 40 days, and he has a remnant group with him, which we've talked a lot in many videos recently and many times over the years that we've shown more and more clarity to. But the Son of Man is here for 40 days with this group, warning as he said he would, as Jonah did. Okay? Knowing that this, we are told, comes first before nation against nation, which means it's white horse rider time. Once the white horse rider time is done and the anointing of the Holy Ghost takes place on the last day of the year, we know that the 14 years begin on the day and hour no one knows. Watch this. When we go to Mark's discourse, look at what Mark's discourse says. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's no but before all these. There's just but take heed to yourselves. So they're going to deliver you up into councils. Okay? We see all this. There's going to be division within families, believers and non-believers within them. And then you've got the abomination of desolation. This is the mark of the beast on the time of seals, which is the, we are, right? We are portable temples covered in skins like Moses' temple. It was portable and it was covered in skin. That's us. We are still the temple of God. During the time of seals, it is still the temple of God within the church age, within the time of the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. This is when they flee into the wilderness, into the mountains, when the mark of the beast comes. And that's why you see now it's going to be a time worse than it ever was since the beginning uh, of creation. Antichrist and false prophets show up. And then we see, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall. You see, this is what you're seeing at the end of the sixth seal. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, plural, with power and great glory. This is when he's coming, at the end of the sixth seal. What happens at the end of this sixth seal time frame? Well, Rachel's time, right? Rachel, now it's spring wheat. Now it's time for the spring wheat harvest. But the spring wheat harvest, even though it's ready and starting its harvest, it cannot be observed until the second day of unleavened bread. When you go to Revelation chapter 6, you now see in Revelation chapter 6, they're all crying out, freaking out, to say, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. This is the end of six years of seals. Well, if it began at the day and hour no one knows, what would six years later be? What would the end of six years later be? The day and hour no one knows. Well, check this out. In Mark's discourse, remember, you don't read this in Luke's. But when you come to Mark's, there's the coming of the Son of Man, and it's the day and hour no one knows. But of that day and of that hour. You know what else you don't see? You don't see any mention in Mark's about as it was in the days of Noah. No mention of the days of Noah. But you do get of that day and hour no one knows. Well, what would six years later be if it starts at the Feast of Trumpets? Six years later would be the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets. Which means in the midst of the seventh year would be about six months later. Hello. Six months later, approximately, at the second day of unleavened bread when they can now use the spring wheat because now it is considered usable and it's 
Kadosh or Yashon, whatever it is. Old wheat, Leah. New wheat, Rachel. The older before the younger. I've done all of this with scripture, guys. And it's the same thing. If you go look at when wheat is ready, when is winter wheat harvested and when does the harvest come to an end? It starts late May, early June, and it ends uh, late July, early August of every single year. You think that's by chance? And the winter wheat of the Feast of Weeks wheat, it's not used until the harvest is over. Then it's ground up and they make two loaves with leaven. Pretty wild, right? It's late July to early August every year when that harvest is done. 50 days from there, guess what it equals? You guessed it, Feast of Trumpets. So six years later, when he's coming at the end of the six year of seals, and they see him, like see this him in the clouds and heavenly Mount Zion coming, everybody's freaking out. He's coming on the day and hour no one knows. That's why they're not going to know also when they're going, because even though the harvest was ready, they still have a few more months before the actual rapture takes place in Revelation chapter 7. Watch this now. Let's go to Matthew. All this is going to tie back to that, to that wedding picture of the 13 to 14 years as well. Watch this. Matthew's discourse. You have the false prophet in the first half, which you didn't have in Mark. And there's a whole story. We've done teachings on it as to why. Then you have the abomination of desolation. You'll notice that it's spoken of differently than Mark's. Because now Matthew's discourse is no longer seals. Now we're in trumpets. And in the midst of trumpets, the temple, the physical temple, was rebuilt in the first three and a half years of trumpets. Which means in the Matthew discourse, when the abomination of desolation takes place and the wording is different than Mark's because it's in the holy place, that's because the holy place of the temple will have been rebuilt in the first three and a half years of the trumpet judgments. And then what happens? Well, then he comes to step in the holy place, and here he is. The false Christ is back. False prophets there with him. <clears throat> we know Satan's been cast down at this point. It's about ten and a half years. You see, you're at about ten and a half years into tribulation, right? You're in the eleventh year, which is about ten and a half years, and that's the abomination of desolation now taking place in the temple that was rebuilt. Messiah and those that were rebuilding are now cut off, and it's a time worse than it ever was since creation, including the midpoint of Luke's discourse uh, of Mark's discourse of seals, and it says, "But this time it will never be as bad as this ever again." And then what happens? Then comes the end of tribulation time frame, and in Matthew twenty four twenty nine. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in. Nope. Coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's coming. Now feet down for the whole world to see as lightning from one end unto the other. And verse 31 says, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. It is the last trump because it is the last trumpet. And it is also that silver trump, if you will. Right. That silver trumpet. It is the final trump of God, the final trumpet. It is the Revelation chapter 10. This is why when you read in Revelation chapter 10, 
as soon as the seventh trumpet sounds, uh, verse 7, Revelation 10, verse 7, and in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, what's he sounding? The last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God should be finished. Why would the mystery of God should be, why would it be finished? Because they're now seeing the Lord coming as lightning from one end unto the other on the clouds of heaven. This is, what, this is what's happening. And he's doing it. It's happening at the last trumpet. Now watch this. Where does that put us on the chart for those that are new? It puts us right here. You might think, well, wait a second. No, it puts us at the end of 14 years, doesn't it? Nope. It was, it'll be three and a half years of rebuilding the city and the streets. And yes, it'll leave three and a half years to the end of trumpets. But just like the story of Jacob, who worked 20 years and then made a covenant in the new year, just like the 13 years and then she could be married, and then there's the, the betrothal, the covenant, and he's preparing a place for one year. It's the exact same story. In the final eight year, in the final seven years of trumpet judgments, it's three and a half years of rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. And in the final three and a half years, you're about to witness, if you haven't been here before, that these final three and a half years are broken up into two and a half and one. And I'm going to prove to you that yet again, the final 14th year is a renewing of a covenant for one year. It's absolutely in, impeccably incredible. Watch this. So knowing now that the Lord is now coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the 13th, or like the prophetic picture of Jacob at the end of those 20, which is the end of the 13th in tribulation, <laughs> it's the picture of the Lord now returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. Watch this. What happens? We now have the day and hour no one knows. Well, fitting, isn't it? It began on the day and hour no one knows. Six years ended and it was the day and hour no one knows when they saw him coming on heavenly Mount Zion in the clouds. It was now ending the 13 years on the day and hour, right? And beginning the 14th at this day and hour, no one knows when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives because it's going to be the Feast of Trumpets. The 14 years began at the Feast of Trumpets. It will end at the Feast of Trumpets after 13. <laughs> and that's why it says it's the day and hour no one knows in Matthew. But in this day and hour, no one knows, you have the story now of Noah as it was in the days of Noah. You see, you didn't have any of this in Luke. You only had day and hour in Mark. In Matthew, at his coming as lightning from one end unto the other, on the clouds, it's the day and hour no one knows, but it's also as it was in the days of Noah. Why is it as it was in the days of Noah representing by this final year? Do you know that the days of Noah, watch this. Do you know that the days of Noah, okay, there's just your evidence, the day and hour no one knows. It's a Hebrew idiom, feast of trumpets, right? Day and hour no one knows, Rosh Hashanah, feast of trumpets. But now watch this. How long were the days of Noah? Where was that? Oh, shoot, I had it opened. How long were the days of Noah? Uh, where was it? Usually it lets me know because I had it open. But anyways, we've covered it before. We know that the days of Noah are one year and 10 days long. 
Man, I still want to find it. <clears throat> Let me see. Yeah, here we go. You can even see it right here. So one lunar year on the arc plus 10 days, right? That's because in Genesis chapter 7, from when the flood began, it was the second month, right? It was the second month, second month, 17th day of the month. And so some people, when they look at prophecy, they believe that it's possible to point to this and think that this is when everything's going to begin. But really it's not. It's a prophetic picture of the final year. It's not 14 years of the days of Noah. It's the final 14th year of the days of Noah. And the final 14th year, the flood began on the second day, uh, second month, 17th day. And it ended on the second month, 27th day of the month. A year and 10 days long. Okay? A year and 10 days long. So what does that mean? Well, if it ended or if it began that one year on the Feast of Trumpets, then one year later, with this year being as it was in the days of Noah, one year later is the Feast of Trumpets, and 10 more days is what? The Feast of Atonement. Atonement. And for those of you who haven't heard this before, why is it so important that we can prove that this final year of Matthew 24 corresponds to the final year of the days of Noah. Why is it so important that it's a year and 10 days long? Because in a Jubilee cycle count of seven, 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 and seven, which is 49, the 49th year in a Jubilee count is a year that is one day uh, sorry, that is one year and 10 days long. Only the 49th year, which this is a 49-year picture, these are the final three sevens, only the 49th year is a year and 10 days long. And why is that, you may ask? Because the Jubilee... Oh, I said 26 earlier. Chapter 25 of Leviticus. The Jubilee is when the trumpet is sounded after 49 years, there's an additional 10 days. You see, because it goes from trumpets to trumpets, there's an additional 10 days to the seventh month, which is atonement, when they proclaim liberty in the land and everyone is returned their possessions for what? the final jubilee year you see how wild that is you see how wild it is that the count from 29 a.d gave us a final count of jubilee right here directly in line with the 21 year count that began from the feast of trumpets in 2017 that will end seven years at the feast of trumpets plus 10 days that will then declare Right here, the final jubilee. From when Jesus proclaimed the jubilee, declaring that 29 AD was a jubilee. This is wild stuff, guys. I hope you're able to track and follow this along. Because now look what happens in Matthew chapter 24. Knowing that that final year is the days of Noah, it's also what? It's also the 13 years and then preparing the, the, the place for one year. It's also Jacob, the 20 years, and then he makes a covenant with his father-in-law. Look what happens after Matthew 24. And as it was the day and hour, no one knows. And it was in the days of Noah. Look what happens when you get to chapter 25. parable of the foolish and wise virgins and the wedding this is the jewish wedding brothers and sisters 
Do you notice that it follows the days of Noah? Do you know why? Because it's after 13 years she can be married. Then he prepares a place for one year. What's, he, what's the Lord going to do in this year? He's going to destroy all the enemies of Jerusalem, all the enemies of his people. We know uh, um, uh, false prophet, antichrist, are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. It's going to be the treading of the grapes of the winepress of the wrath of God. Satan is then going to be bound for a thousand years. And then what's going to happen? Well, look what happens in Ezekiel chapter 47. In Ezekiel chapter 47 is a prophetic picture of the end of that 14th year. Okay? So it could be something happening in the middle, throughout, for the end. In Ezekiel 47, it's a prophetic picture of the very end of that 47th year. And look what happens. Water will replenish the earth from the temple of God. Water will flow out and replenish the earth at the end of him destroying all the enemies in this final year covenant that he renews with all people. Just like Jacob and his father-in-law after 20. Just like a bride after 13 years. And just like Daniel. Did you know that? Did you know that it's just like Daniel as well? Watch this in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, you've all seen this, but unfortunately, if you're new, you've only seen it as seven years. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, which means it must have been attacked and destroyed, Jerusalem, for there to be a decree to rebuild. But listen to what it says. Unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Do you know what these weeks are? They are weeks of years. Shabuah. They are seven years. These are the seven years of seals. While the Jews, having been attacked, will be removed from the land for seven years while it rests. And the world is going through World War III, the Antichrist, and everything else. Hello. The Jews are destroyed first at the beginning of nation against nation, which is what Jesus in Luke 21 is warning of for 40 days because they must be removed from the land. Why? Because the land has been defiled and hasn't had its rest. The land is going to rest for seven weeks of years. And then they're going to start to rebuild. So what is after seven years of seals? Now begins the time of trumpets. And it's right here. Comma and means separate time in addition to. Three score in two weeks. So there's two years. Three score is 60 of actual weeks. So it's about. Three years and two months that they'll be rebuilding the city, the streets, the walls, even in troublous time, which is the first half of trumpets. And then it says, and after those, well, I'll, I'll say about three and a half years of trumpet judgments, which will take you to about ten and a half years into total tribulation. The first half of the seven years of trumpets, they were rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. And then Messiah is cut off. When Messiah is cut off, it's because of the people of the prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's because Aunt, uh, Satan has been cast down. The pit has been opened. Antichrist returns. False prophet is there. And this is when the abomination of desolation from Matthew 24 takes place. This is why I was telling you, you would think that, oh, when the cutoff happens, there's three and a half more years. But it doesn't go a full three and a half. It only goes two and a half until the Lord returns. That means when Messiah is cut off and they come in and destroy the temple and, and 
he stands in it and declares himself to be God, who is uh, Antichrist with Satan and the false prophet there, they're going to have two and a half of the final three and a half years to do their chaos. And this is revealed to us in this when it says, and you'll go after them with a flood. And then there's going to be a war that will come to an end. This period of time will last two and a half years. And we get the answer to it in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, when he says, how long will this be? And he's told that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. There's no end between time and times, which means it's one, two, plus, with an and here, and a half. It's two and a half of the final three and a half years. And look at what it says. And when these two and a half years are accomplished to scatter the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Isn't that exactly what we read in at the sound of the seventh trumpet? When is that? At the very beginning. So when the 13th year is over, it's the feast of trumpets at the sound of the seventh, la which is the last trumpet. As soon as it begins to sound, the mystery is over. It's finished. Because the Lord is seen coming on the day and hour no one knows, feet down on the Mount of Olives for the final year as the days of Noah where he'll destroy all the enemies of his people. He will restore it. Water will flow from the temple and will renew the whole earth. This is what you see in Isaiah. Watch this. In Isaiah 65. In Isaiah 65, remember the Lord has to renew the earth, right? Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. No, he doesn't actually create a new one. Look at what it says. A new heavens comes from, see, new, fresh thing. Nope. Look at what it comes from. It's actually the word to rebuild or to repair. That's because it's not a new heaven and a new earth coming for the millennial reign. After he's destroyed the enemies, uh, false prophet and antichrist cast into the lake of fire, Satan's been bound. The water will now flow from the throne. It will be repaired and replenished. And it will flow from the throne, and it'll be the millennial reign where people will live to hundreds of years again. But now, let me show you that it's two and a half of the final three and a half. You're going to see this, as you just saw in Daniel 12, that brought us to the end of, of uh, Matthew 24, and then you see 25 of Matthew is when he now comes at the end of that 14th year and you're going to have that Jewish wedding, right? And that Jewish wedding is going to take place at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's going to be seven days and then the eighth day is called what? The new beginning. And what's the new beginning? It's the Jubilee year. Okay, watch this. So now in seeing this, <clears throat> now in being able to understand that Leah is the picture of the pre-creation stuff and that he fulfills seven years, then gets her, and she is the older sister or representing old wheat that goes first, that is connected to the Feast of Weeks, now you're seeing this picture of a count that began 2017 Feast of Trumpets. Seven years coming to an end, 50 days shy, Gentile bride, Leah, winter wheat at the Feast of Weeks. 50 more days, and when they end, it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost for the remnant workers. Then Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed at the Feast of Trumpets. Six years come to an end. It's the day and hour no one knows. Feast of Trumpets. In the midst of that seventh year, the Leah, spring wheat, I mean Rachel, spring wheat, the younger, is now ready, having been harvested, 
and the great multitude will be brought in in the seventh year of seals, just like Revelation chapter 7. Then you've got the seven years of trumpets. At those seven years of trumpets, at the end of six, we see the picture, 13 and a covenant with his bride. The big picture, Jacob, 20 years and a covenant with his father. We saw in Daniel chapter 9 that the two and a half years after the temple is rebuilt and then Messiah is cut off, he goes after them with the flood. I'm going to show you in a second. And unto the end of the war, which is the war against the two witnesses, uh, desolations are determined, which brings us to what? Seven years, about three and a half of rebuilding the city and the streets, and then what? Two and a half. The two and a half of the final three and a half brings you to 13 years. Well, again, this leaves us one more year. Well, that's exactly what we read in verse 27. And he, this is the Lord, returning now as lightning from one end to the other on the clouds of heaven. He's going to confirm the covenant with many for one year, one week, one week of years. He's going to renew the covenant. <clears throat> when? In the final year. When does he have that covenant with his bride? The final year. What was the covenant with Jacob after 20 years? All three of them equal the exact same prophetic time frame. And the story of all creation is the story of the Hebrew alphabet. And the big picture is 21,000 years in the dimension of time. It is seven days, seven days, 21 days to the Lord in heaven. And in the end of days, it was seven years of preparing the Gentile lay a bride from the Revelation 12 sign, the pre-sign to warn us. Then it will be the seven years for his spring younger Rachel. And when it's all over, it'll be his final Jewish bride and a covenant with us all when it's all over renewed. Everything there in order. So you're seeing why, if you're new, the main focus that we share on is the 14th to the 15th year. You could say it's the final 7-7, seven, seven, and this is the 49th year. So 15, 22, 49, it's all the same. But these, all this, the 50 days and the 14 years is the entirety of tribulation. This is why the focus is there. This is why you see here in this ministry, we talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 12 a lot. Because this is where the revelation of the 14 years and above began. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. You see, in Christ, the spirit filled. And it's like a rapture, okay? Like a harpazo, that's the Greek word for, harp, for rapture. Like a rapture to the third heaven. This is the Revelation chapter 12 between verse one and verse two that we spoke about in the beginning before she travailed. They're going to the third heaven. This was the confirmation because then it says, and I knew such a man, which means not quite in Christ like the first one, but kind of how he was caught up to paradise. And when is it all about? He's recounting 14 years and above, and he's talking about the third time. Now he's coming to them. This is for Judah. Hello. A taking, a taking, and a coming. You see? A pre, a mid, and a returning, feet down. So now when you go to Revelation chapter 12, listen how much sense it makes. The great sign is going to be seen. And then what? Before she travailed, third heaven, pre-trip. Travailing is the 40 days of the Son of Man in Luke's discourse. And then 
The 14 years begin with the attack on Jerusalem, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This will be about two and a half years. And then there appeared a great red dragon, seven heads and ten horns. This is when the time frame of when the Antichrist, the beast, will get his power to continue for 42 months. This will take you to the end of six years of seals, which is why you see a third of the stars drew the third of the stars. Uh, um, his tail drew a third of the stars, uh, did cast him to the woman, which is ready to be delivered to devour a child as soon as it was born. And listen now, verse five. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Listen to this. And her child was caught up. What did we see for the second one? Such a man, meaning kind of like the first one, but not really, was caught up. And that was the one to paradise. This is the mid-trib great multitude rapture of Mark's group of the world, the Gentiles grafted into the house of Israel. And it is the was caught up. It's the revelation, uh, uh, the was caught up. Of, uh, uh, of going to paradise, it is the Revelation chapter 7, great multitude rapture. Then what happens? Well, then you've got the first half of trumpets, 1260 days. When the two witnesses have completed their work, you see, remember there was a war that breaks out, right? And unto the end of the war, well, that's because the two witnesses who are prophesying for the first half are prophesying for the first half of trumpets. And then when they have finished their prophesying, then war breaks out against them. That's what we get when the pit is opened. You see, they'll finish their 1260 days. And then what happens? The one who comes out of the pit, right? When the antichrist comes, comes out of the pit at the fifth trumpet, comes out of the bottomless pit. Now he's going after them and he's going to make war against the two witnesses and that war is going to last for two and a half years. From the beginning of the fifth trumpet to the end of the sixth trumpet is two and a half years. So now at mid-trumpets, when the 1260 days comes to an end, this is 10 and a half years into trumpets. I mean, into tribulation. Look what happens. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And Michael and his angels won. The dragon is cast down. This is mid trumpets now, 10 and a half years approximately into tribulation. It's the fifth trumpet and the pit is going to be opened. The pit, when the pit is opened at the fifth trumpet, it's called the first woe. And he knows that he has a short time and he's going to have great wrath. And what does he do? Remember Daniel chapter 9, verse 26? He goes after her. Remember, he goes after the woman. Watch this. Verse 15, Revelation 12. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. You see? After the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. What did we see in Daniel 20, 9, 26? He goes after them with a flood and then unto the end of the war. This is the flood that he goes after them with at, at mid-trumpets, which is mid uh, 10 and a half years into tribulation. It's then the two and a half years of the three and a half that remain that he's made war, that he's now going to make war against the two witnesses because they have completed they're 1260 days. And now look what happens when she flees away, having flown away on the wings of an eagle. She's escaped the, the flood. The, the earth is open as the Lord did for them. And how long is she taken away? She says she's taken away into the wilderness. See, this is when they go into the wilderness. This is Matthew's mid trumpets, Matthew's mid discourse, the abomination of desolation into her place where she is nourished for a time comma, and times, comma, and half a time. You see, in Daniel, there was no and here, so there was no addition. Here there is, so it's one plus two plus a half. 
This is three and a half years, which is why we know that Satan, and once the pit is open and the beast is back, they're going to have two and a half of the final three and a half years. Once their two and a half is over, it's the Lord returning, like Matthew 9, 27, like Jacob's covenant after 20 years, like the bride after 13 and then the 14th year to prepare a place. He's coming to destroy the enemy in that final year. It's when he comes as the days of Noah. Feet down on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14. So that group that flew away on the wings of an eagle to a place protected, they're there until the end of the 14 years. When the end of those final three and a half years are done, they weren't only saved from the three and a half years of Satan and the beast and, and going into the temple and declaring himself God and all of that. They were also saved from the destruction of everything that came when the Lord went against all of the enemies of the world that came against his people. They will be brought back when? At the end of 14 years, at the beginning of the Jubilee, which is why Ezekiel chapter 48 reveals to us in the final chapter when all the tribes get their land back. It is the final jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. And the counts are revealed from 29 AD. They're revealed from the end of 70 years when they captured all of Jerusalem. They're revealed in seven-year Shemitah cycles that are seven times seven that reveal that the beginning of the 21-year big picture to the final 22nd year new beginning started at the Feast of Trumpets at the Revelation 12 sign revealed to us by Scotty Clark in 2017. And I believe he will get his due reward. I believe that since spring of last year, and his time is coming, he's paid for it. That was his job. It wasn't anything more. He did it. The world by millions and millions, I think even more, 10 million plus have heard it. Most went back to sleep. But many were awakened and continued to dug and continued to dig. And we can now show you through the incredible revelations revealed here in just over six years. Remember, the official beginning of these revelations began in September of 2017. It will also be seven years complete for me in 2024. I find that very fitting. Brothers and sisters, it is a big picture. Not only of the seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, but of the big picture, seven years in the 21 to 22 year letters of the Hebrew alphabet, of the gap theory creation to the days creation to the thousands creation, revealing seven days, seven days, seven days, 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 in the dimension of time in seven years, seven years, seven years of the end of days to the final jubilee in the millennial reign. When the millennial reign is all over, it'll be the end of 21,000 years to the Lord God from the beginning to us. It'll be the end of the 21st day to the Lord God. And it'll be the new beginning of eternity. Now, let's have a look and see what Revelation chapter 22 says, which is not only the end of the millennial reign, but it is also the beginning. Remember, like the end of the 21 to the beginning of the 22. Look at where it is. At the beginning of the 22nd year picture. And he showed me a pure river of water of river. Sorry, he showed me a pure river of water of life 
clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Remember Ezekiel 47 was a prophetic picture to the end of that year. You can say at the end to the beginning of the next. When water proceeds out of the throne to fulfill the cleansing of the end of the final year of tribulation before the new beginning of the jubilee on the earth. And in God the Father, the Son's big picture, when the 21,000 year comes to an end, it begins the 22nd with the new heavens and new earth and water flowing clear as crystal from the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the truth. This is the revelation. It is all here. It's all for us to understand. I pray that this has blessed you. I pray that you take the time, if you're new, to track through this, to pause it, to seek it out, that you'll remember to go back either to the YouTube playlist link or to the Ministry Revealed intro page channel, uh, uh, intro page, and watch these first four videos. It will all begin to make crystal clear sense. And brothers and sisters, it's 2024. Let that sink in. It's 2024. And we're looking at the latest, this period of time right here. We're in 2024. <laughs> All right. So brothers and sisters, new brothers and sisters, I pray this reaches you. I pray many of you guys will share this. Get it out to everybody else that we can. Hashtag them. Do whatever you can that we can reach these people that are out there talking about this Revelation 12 sign again. Brothers and sisters, it is important. It is connected. It is the beginning of the big picture, 21, 22 year count. It is the picture of Revelation. It is the count of all of creations. It is the count of the Hebrew alphabet. Brothers and sisters, I pray it blesses you. I pray you receive it. You understand it. Seek it out. Diligently search it. Pray over it. And feel free to email us, get in touch with us, join us in the forum, and ask any questions you may have. We will more than happily help to answer anything that we can. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.